Westbrook Online, welcome, welcome, welcome. We are so glad that you have uh, decided to join us today in our time of worship and teaching. And I hope and pray that as we go through this service today, God will encourage you, uh, God will bless you, God will speak to you, and uh, when the service is over, uh, you'll be glad uh, that you joined us. As we crank into a new season, as we move into uh, the fall season, uh, things are going to be changing a little bit in your world with all the back to school and, and all the fall things that are going to begin to take place. But what's not changing is our commitment to you, uh, even though you are a part of our online congregation, our online family. And as we say every week, as we get ready to move into our time of worship, we want you to do your best to stay connected to us. Contact us. Let us know that you're part of our online congregation. And we'll do our best uh, to minister to you, to encourage you, to pray for you, uh, to bless you as we share together in, in this time uh, of, of worship and trusting Christ with all that we have. So you make sure that you do that. Find whatever way you can to connect with us and let us know that you're watching and let us know that you're a part of our family. Uh, before our service ends today, take a moment, if you will, and uh, uh, remember the great sacrifice that Jesus has made for us. Uh, in our on, uh, live services, we take communion together. We would love for you to share in that as well. Find a piece of uh, bread, find a cup of juice, and take some time to reflect upon what Jesus has done for you. And then we wanna encourage you to be a part of our ministry as a financial steward as well. Uh, you can give online, you can go to our website and find the information about that, but we greatly appreciate uh, your engagement. Wherever you are in this area, in this region, or in this world, uh, we're grateful that you're a part of our online family. Yeah, let me pray. And then we want you to enjoy this service. Would you bow your heads? Lord, as we come to you today, as we move into a time of worship, God, we pray that you'll be glorified, you'll be blessed. And that God, uh, through the words of songs, through the words of the message, that God, you'll speak to us, that we might be the kind of people that you want us to be. So use this service for your grace and for your glory. In Jesus we pray, amen and amen. Enjoy the service today. Hey everybody, welcome to Westbrook Christian Church. Would you stand as we worship together today? It's so good to be with you guys for another Sunday. There's a name that levels mountains Carves out highways through the sea I've seen its power unravel battles right in front of me. There's a faith that stands defiant. Sins can lie to his knees. I've seen his praise unravel shackles. Right off my feet Cause that's the power of your name Just a mention makes a way Giants fall and strongholds break And there is healing That's the power that I claim It's the same that Every prayer I make is on an empty grave. Cause that's the power of your name. Just a mention.
taking ground I see you press ahead Your power is dangerous to the enemy's camp You still do miracles You will do what you said For you're the same God now as you've always been Your spirit breaking out Your kingdom Online, are you ready for a different kind of sermon today? And I'm not talking about a different style of preaching or a different brand of preaching or a different form of a communication. I'm talking about a theme. I, I want to tackle a different topic today, a topic that I have strong convictions about personally, but a topic that I think needs to be navigated very carefully in the church I want to talk about a topic or a theme at the end of my sermon today that I never talk about, and that is politics in the church. Now, before you start to salivate and begin to think to yourself, well, it's about time, back up the train a little bit. As you might imagine, I'm actually going to try my best to bring some perspective to all of us as it relates to this polarizing dialogue And I'm going to use our text today that we're going to look at from Acts 15 as a springboard to you, to us as Christians, as we navigate this upcoming election cycle. Grab your Bibles, if you will, there in uh, 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 online world. And I want you to turn with me to Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15. As I studied uh, this passage of Scripture and saw the learnings from this passage today, I saw some lessons that I I really think could be applied to us in many areas of life. I, I saw lessons that, that could be uh, applied in our, in our relationships and in our work associations and our family connections and the like, but lessons that I think really also can speak to us as Christian Americans. Unless this is your very first Sunday worshiping with us at Westbrook Online, and then you know that we are in this summer sermon series through the book of Acts. And we've dedicated 13 weeks this summer to study this fascinating book of, of history about the first century church. And, and already in the first eight weeks of the study, we have seen some incredible movement of God in the lives of a ton of people. It began on the day of Pentecost, right? The the close followers of Jesus were were sitting up in this upper room. They were a bit bewildered. They were most likely a a bit baffled. They were loaded with questions, questions like, now what? I mean, they had just seen their leader and their hero, Jesus, crucified. They had seen him agonizingly walk through the street carrying his own cross. They had watched him die. They knew that he had been buried, and they all witnessed, and they hung out with, and they talked with a resurrected Jesus. A lot of it didn't add up, and it frankly didn't make much sense, but that was pretty par for the course in following this Jesus. 
To top it off, not many days later, Jesus then told them, he said, hang tight, because in a matter of time, some special God power is going to come upon you, and then I want you to go crazy telling everybody about this message. Jesus wasn't a political leader. He didn't come to overthrow the Roman kingdom. No, no, no. He came to live within the Roman kingdom, yet to perpetuate this exciting new spiritual kingdom that would last forever. A spiritual kingdom that would set his followers apart from the rest of society and set them up for an eternal destiny that would never spoil or fade. And a lot of people tried to drag Jesus and his followers into a political debate and the political dialogue of the first century. But Jesus kept it separate, and the leaders of the first century church did their best to stay focused and to keep Christ's message of grace and liberty at the forefront as well. Well, as we get to chapter 15, the polarizing dialogue was all about who exactly is this message supposed to go to? Is it for the Jewish people or is it for everybody? Now, Jesus seemed to model the belief that it is for everybody. It's for sinners. It's for women. It's for children. It's for the handicapped. It's, it's for all of us. And, and the way the church kicked off in the early days took the message of Christ to everyone. Even when the church scattered into different parts of the world, they took it to everyone. And when the people were confused, God used dreams and directives to get people on track. Remember uh, Peter in his vision in this big sheet that came down from heaven. Pastor Jake talked about that and preached about that a couple of weeks ago. He talked about stepping out of your comfort zone. Does that ring a bell? Well, by the time we get to Acts chapter 15, the Christian way of life had, had, had kind of taken root. It had kind of taken, taken storm a little bit. This message was, was spreading like wildfire. Naysayers and negatives had already tried to shut it down, and, and now there was this little internal political upheaval on who was right and who was wrong and how they should go about things. So the issue was brought up at the board meeting of the Jerusalem Council. This was the group of people that was overseeing this new religion, and it took place somewhere around 49 to 50 A.D., about 15 years after the church had started. And the council was prompted by the spread of the gospel among the Gentiles and the question of how they should integrate into the predominantly Jewish Christian uh, community. Some Jewish believers argued that Gentiles should be circumcised and follow the Mosaic law as a prerequisite for salvation, while others, including the Apostle Paul, remember him, we've talked about him, the Apostle Paul emphasized salvation through faith in Christ alone. Well, as the dialogue took place, what resulted was a commitment to uphold unity, to embrace grace, and to seek wisdom from Scripture. Despite differing backgrounds and cultures and perspectives, the apostles and the elders came together to seek the Lord's guidance. And the board's decision emphasized salvation by grace through faith rather than by works of the law. And this crucial revelation underscores that our standing before God rests not on our achievements, but on his unmerited favor. And without a doubt, without a doubt, throughout the deliberations, the apostles turned to scripture for guidance, affirming the authority of God's word as the ultimate source of wisdom and truth. Let's look at this together. If you have your Bibles, I want you to, I want you to follow along with me. It's a rather lengthy passage of scripture, so hang on. Chapter 15 says, Some men came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. And this brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. And so Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and the elders about this question. The church sent them on their way, and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the brothers very glad. And when they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders, to whom they reported everything God had done through them. 
And then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to obey the law of Moses. Well, the apostles and elders met to consider this question, and after much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed up, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, and for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the disciples a yoke that neither we nor our fathers have been able to bear? No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they are. And the whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the miraculous signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. And when they finished, James spoke up. Brothers, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God at first showed his concern by taking from the Gentiles a people for himself. The words of the prophet are in agreement with this, as it is written, after this I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent, its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it, that the remnant of men may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things, then have been known for ages. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, from blood. For Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read from the synagogues on every Sabbath. Oh yeah, the Jerusalem Council, you see, the Jerusalem Council marked a a significant moment of decision for the early church. And there was some political wrangling back and forth, right? Yet this council, this meeting, established the principle that salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ comes alone and that adherence to Jewish customs was not necessary for Gentile believers. And this decision paved the way for the expansion of the gospel to all nations and laid the foundation for the diverse and the inclusive nature of the Christian church. This council's resolution is a testament to to the importance of seeking God's guidance through prayer and scripture and respectful dialogue when addressing theological and practical matters within the church. And when the board meeting ended... Right When the council of Jerusalem was let out, they all said, well, okay, that settles it. The gospel is for everyone. Done deal. Nothing more needs to be said. And off to the races they went. The gospel is for everyone. We're not debating that issue anymore, they said. And in most ways, today's world, we're not debating that issue as well. But here's what I want us to catch today. Here's what I want us to catch today. In our present era, marked by diversity and varying perspectives, the Jerusalem Council example, I think, resonates profoundly. Just as the early church upheld unity and embraced grace and sought wisdom from Scripture, listen, we too must stand firm in our faith, showing love and respect in our interactions with fellow believers and non-believers alike. And this is what I want to share with you today as I share my heart. As the political dialogue continues, and as it will for sure ratchet up over the next several months relative to the political parties here in the U.S., the Republicans and the Democrats and their beliefs and their candidates, listen, my friends, may we as the church of Jesus Christ, may we hold high the ideals of unity and grace and wisdom from God. May we, as followers of Jesus, uphold the ideals founded in this council of unity, grace, and wisdom. I, I, I'm sure you've seen this over the last several elections. I certainly have. Thankfully, not to a large extent in our church, but throughout the nation, throughout the nation, the involvement of U.S. politics in local churches has had several negative impacts. 
Political differences can lead to division and conflicts within congregations. When political debates and affiliations take precedence over the core message of the gospel, it can create tension and hinder the unity that should characterize a Christian community. When political issues dominate conversations and activities within a church, there's a risk of losing sight of the primary mission of the church which is to spread the message of salvation to disciple believers, to to serve the community. A shift in focus from spiritual matters to political ones can dilute the impact of the church's ministry. In other words, the intertwining of politics and your Christianity can lead to the misrepresentation of the gospel. Associating Christianity with a, a specific political belief risks presenting a distorted version of Christianity that appeals to a narrow segment of society rather than the transformative message of Christ's love for all. To maintain the integrity and the effectiveness of the local churches, it's important for us to prioritize the gospel message and the spiritual growth of individuals over everything else, even political agendas. And while churches, I believe, can and should address moral and ethical issues from a biblical standpoint, they should strive to do so in a way that encourages unity and love and respect, even for differing viewpoints. Listen, the politicking in the early church, the politicking in the early church, that's what what it was in Acts chapter 15. The politicking in the early church, had it not been resolved with these three principles at the forefront, could have severely affected the impact of this new movement. And folks, if we're not careful, If we're not careful, especially as we move into this new political season, we could do even more damage to our witness as the church. And it may not have been a big issue here at Westbrook, maybe maybe not for you at all, but it's certainly been a big issue with the big C, capital C church here in this country. And so would you pray with me about this? Would you join me in being a great role model of unity and grace and biblical wisdom. Now, as you join me in that, I, I want to just take a couple of moments and, and, and get a couple more things out there, if I may. Since I have, since I have dove, dove, dove into this mud and mire, let me say a few more things before I pull myself out of it. Let me give you a couple of how-tos. How do we, first of all, how do we as 21st century Christians in America uphold unity, embrace grace, and seek wisdom from God's word? Let's break them down one by one. First of all, how do we as 21st century Christians in America uphold unity? Well, the answer is prioritize the gospel and maintain a Christ-centered focus. That's how. Upholding unity among 21st century Christians in America involves intentional efforts to uphold and to prioritize the core principles of the gospel and to maintain a Christ-centered focus even amidst a diverse perspectives and cultural influences. We must emphasize the foundational tenets of the Christian faith, such as the deity of Christ and the authority of Scripture and salvation through faith and the importance of love and compassion Friends, by centering discussions and teachings around these core beliefs, Christians can find common ground and foster unity. And then we must engage in open, respectful, and empathetic conversations about differing viewpoints, including political and social matters. We need to create spaces where individuals can express their op- uh, opinions without fear of judgment and fostering an environment of understanding and cooperation. Be sure to dedicate time to pray. Dedicate time to pray with, for unity within the church and the broader Christian community. Seek God's guidance in navigating challenges and differences and ask for his wisdom to guide discussions and decisions. We, we need to demonstrate Christ-like love and compassion in all of our interactions. Loving one another as Christ loved us serves as a powerful testimony to the world and helps prevent us 
and having conflicts from escalating. John 13 verses 34 and 35 says this, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Lastly, if we need to approach discussions with, with humility and with recognizing that, that no one has a complete understanding of every issue, we need to extend grace to one another. Get this, my friends. In a world marked by differences, unity, unity among 21st century Christians in America can be a powerful testimony of the transformative impact of Christ's love. And that requires a commitment to uphold the core teachings of the gospel while navigating disagreements with grace, respect, and a shared desire to bring glory to God. How do we uphold unity? Prioritize the principles of the gospel and maintain a Christ-centered focus. Here's the next one. How do we as 21st century Christians in America embrace grace? Here's the answer. Adopt a mindset and a lifestyle that reflects the unmerited favor of Jesus. Embracing grace as a 21st century Christian in America involves adopting a mindset and a lifestyle that reflects the unmerited favor and unconditional love that God extends to us. Regularly reflect on your own need for God's grace and your need for forgiveness. Recognize that you are not immune to mistakes and shortcomings, which helps cultivate humility and a deeper appreciation for the grace you've received. Just as God forgives, we should be willing to forgive others. Let go of grudges and bitterness and resentment and seek to reconcile with those who have wronged you. Demonstrate compassion and empathy towards others, understanding that everybody has their struggles and their challenges. Approach others with kindness and seek to understand their perspectives before making judgments. If conflicts arise, prioritize reconciliation over being right. I love how one author put it. He said, engage in open conversations, listen actively, and work towards understanding and healing. Seek God's guidance and embrace grace daily. Pray for the heart that is receptive to his leading and a spirit that is open to receiving and extending that grace. Lastly, avoid legalism. Refrain from imposing strict rules or expectations on yourself and, and others that go beyond biblical principles. Legalism can hinder the experience of God's grace and burden individuals with unnecessary guilt. I'm pretty sure that's what was going on in Acts chapter 15. Did you read that? Bottom line, in a world marked by judgment and criticism, 21st century Christians in America uh, can stand out by embodying grace in their words and their actions and their attitudes. By living out the grace that we have received, we not only reflect Christ's character, but also contribute to a more compassionate and loving society. How do 21st Christians in America embrace grace? You adopt a mindset and a lifestyle that reflects the unmerited favor of Jesus. Let me give you one more. How do we as 21st century Christians in America seek wisdom from Scripture? Here's the answer. Ready? Engage with the Bible regularly and let it light your daily walk. Seeking wisdom from Scripture is a vital practice, I believe, for the 21st century Christians in America to navigate the complexities of life and culture and faith. You hear me talking about this all the time. So, so make a habit of reading the Bible regularly and consistently. Set aside a specific time regularly for personal study and reflection. Choose a reading plan or a devotional that suits your preferences and helps you engage with different parts of the Bible. Maybe, if all else fails, listen to the Scripture as you commute to work. Begin your Bible reading with prayer and asking God to open your heart and mind to His wisdom. Invite the Holy Spirit to guide your understanding and reveal insights as you read. And when facing decisions or challenges, listen, seek guidance from Scripture. 
search for Bible verses that, direct, that, that relate directly to your situation and contemplate their wisdom. Recognize that seeking wisdom from Scripture is a lifelong journey. And so as you live life, approach, approach the Bible with a humble heart, acknowledging that there's always more to learn. Here's the deal. Here's the deal. By consistently engaging with Scripture and seeking its wisdom, 21st century Christians in America can find guidance and comfort and transformation that equips them to navigate the complexities of life and live out their faith with authenticity and with purpose. How do 21st century Christians in America seek wisdom from Scripture, engage with the Bible regularly, and let it light your daily walk? Now, if you've listened to me preach over the years, you know I'm not a political preacher. I, I, over the years, I, I, I've, I've even been called a coward for, for not jumping into the political debate and stating my opinions on whatever was buzzing at the moment. And as a result of my non-engagement in the dialogue publicly, I have been called too politically neutral. As a result of my non-engagement in the dialogue publicly, I have been perceived as too politically liberal. And as a result of my non-engagement in the dialogue publicly, I have been observed as too politically conservative. I've got it all. I've got it all. All of these labels put on me because I, as a pastor, have chosen not to get in the middle of this polarizing dialogue. How I want to be labeled instead as a grace-filled, gospel-centered, Bible-believing Christian, a hope-filled, heaven-bound servant of Jesus Christ. That's how I want to be labeled. And when the community hears me speak or they read my social media, may they see more of my Jesus cheering than siding with the political party. And listen, listen. Friends, don't misunderstand me. I truly believe that as a Christian and as a citizen of this nation, we should vote. Do your part. Exercise your rights. Stand your ground. Vote your beliefs. Study the candidates and vote for the person that you think most represents your beliefs and your stances. But be sure at the end of the day, people see more Jesus cheering from you than anything else. And as you live your life, no matter what is going on around us, especially politically, may we as followers of Jesus uphold unity, embrace grace, and seek wisdom from the Bible. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you for this lesson from the Jerusalem Council that continues to guide us today. The, the challenges that they were facing as the church had some political connotations to it. Who's right? Who's wrong? Who do we believe? God, it's very similar to what we're dealing with today. Who's right? Who's wrong? What do we believe? What's best? In the midst of all that, Lord, grant us the wisdom to embrace unity amidst diversity, to stand strong in the grace of Christ, to approach cultural differences with sensitivity and humility, and may our actions reflect your word and glorify your name. In Jesus' name we pray.